In this video, we're going to talk about how to do a 36 to 48 hour fast safely and dive into more science and what kind of benefits to expect as you go past the 16 to 20 hours in a fasted state, which is timely because I actually just finished my 48 hour fast last night and just came back from a workout and feel absolutely amazing. This is a continuation of my current extended fast series. So if you're just starting your fast now or want details in the first 24 hours or an intermittent fasting protocol, check out the previous video in the description below. We're going to look at the exciting and promising benefits, not just to weight loss, but to overall health and longevity, because it opens up potential reasons and motivations to try extended fasting that increases in effectiveness as you go beyond 20 hours of a single fast. Welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Joe Guevara, and I've been experimenting with all forms of fasting since 2017, and I analyze science-based health and fitness content related to fasting. I also use this channel to share my own experience specific to fitness and how fasting has helped me lose 100 pounds sustainably compared to a caloric deficit or different kinds of diets while still building muscle and strength at the gym. So if you've watched my first video of the safety and benefits of the first 24 hours of a fast, you already know that fasting is relatively safe within that time frame. However, the vast majority of people in their entire lives have never been in a fasted state deliberately for more than 24 hours. So let's dive into some precautions and methods to make sure that you're doing it properly. For a true fast where you get the health benefits of what we're going to be talking about in this video, the biological mechanism that you need to know is that you're trying to reduce your insulin levels to the point where you're increasing ketogenesis, where you're starting to burn your fat stores as your primary source of fuel which is the primary reason why some people lose weight very quickly in this type of fasting. It's worth noting that fasting isn't actually the only thing that triggers autophagy. Calorie restriction, fasting, and exercise, even some supplements can induce autophagy. But like I mentioned in my last video, it's only seen to be accelerated quickly to where it's effective at actually helping you repair your body beyond just upkeep after 16 to 20 hours. You can think about it as giving yourself time to clean your house. If you give yourself no time to clean your house, then, well, you'll easily be in an episode of Hoarders pretty quickly. If you only have, let's say, 30 minutes to clean every single day, you'll probably only have enough time to do the dishes and clean up the things you do on a regular basis. However, sometimes you know that you need to do some spring cleaning. There are things that build up that you won't have time to clean in the span of 30 minutes, like dust on your baseboards, underneath the couch, maybe your garage, things that need a little bit more time to clean. Your body is much the same way. Exercise and calorie restriction produces enough autophagy to maintain where, you, where your health is at now. If you're constantly eating or can't do much exercise, you never give your body a chance to clean itself. If you do intermittent fasting though, or regularly do exercise, then you are likely giving your body a chance to maintain or slightly improve your health. But if you've never fasted long term before, or you're largely sedentary, or you've been in a state where you've become overweight or obese, which I have been, you need to give your body a chance to do some spring cleaning, sometimes even multiple, and that's what extended fasting does through autophagy. The simplified explanation of how autophagy is induced through calorie restriction, fasting, and exercise is that it actually burns off glycogen and glucose for energy. Glycogen is the sugar stored in your muscles, and glucose is the carbohydrate that you consume in your meals that then goes directly into your bloodstream. Only when glucose is used up and glycogen is depleted to a sufficiently low level that autophagy starts to ramp up. It's assumed that the key hormone that triggers all of these health benefits is insulin or the lack of it. There is one disease I would highly discourage from ever doing fasting, and that is type 1 diabetics. Type 1 diabetes is understood to be a genetic disease that causes people not to be able to produce enough or any insulin. So by this logic, your body is naturally in a state of autophagy for the large majority of the time, and too much of anything is a bad thing. So a fast wouldn't do you much good. However, type 2 diabetes is a metabolic disease. It's a disease that builds up over time, causing a condition called insulin resistance, which is when your body gets so much insulin on such a regular basis, like eating sugary foods all the time, that your body becomes incapable of working properly in relation to insulin. Or in other words, you become insulin resistant. In this case, I would highly suggest working with your doctor to discuss the studies I highlight here and see if a fasting inter intervention can help. There are actually clinics in Germany that I know of that use this kind of intervention for diabetes and even other diseases fairly effectively. There are also both a lot of studies and anecdotes of fasting, not just helping but completely eliminating type 2 diabetes. 
However, this needs to be adjusted and controlled depending on what kind of pharmaceuticals you're on as a diabetic. Otherwise, the same protocols for doing a 24 hour fast is the same up to a 48 hour fast. Supplement with electrolytes and water and black tea or coffee if you need it for energy. The big exception and difference is what you do for exercise. In a normal intermittent or 24 hour fast, your body is still in a relative state of balance of growth and repair or catabolism and anabolism. I've done OMAD fairly consistently for the past three years and I'm still able to do a recomp, which means build muscle and lose fat at the same time using OMAD. Once you get past 16 to 20 hours and your body enters into a full state of photophagy, your body is no longer anabolic, which means your body isn't in a state where it builds new cells. It's in a cleaning phase. So I would highly discourage any workouts that are super stressful to your muscles, like heavy weight lifting or high intensity cardio. For the fitness buffs out there, this means not going above an RPE of two or three if you're going to lift at all. This is because the stress you need to grow your muscles isn't going to be repaired like normal compared to if you had a normal protein intake. A key factor in muscle building is how important your nervous system is time to when your body repairs and builds muscles to figure out how big should I get and how many more cells do I need to adapt to that stress. If you're only building and growing one to two days after your workout, the CNS adaptation is no longer going to exist. So anecdotally, I'd consider it a wasted workout at the very least, or detrimental to performance and gains at the very worst. If you do want to stay active, you can do very light cardio or weights, but not to the point where you feel like you're exerting the muscles or running out of breath. The best advice from my own experience is to limit your activity to just a walk. I've done light weights in some extended fast because I really wanted to go to the gym and the level of hunger I get usually causes me to quit the fast and eat something. I've only ever been successful in extended fasting in relation to hunger when I only do very light cardio. Something I personally do during fasting, I will take some supplements that have been indicated to accelerate mechanisms for either energy or autophagy, namely black coffee, which contains a chemical called orexin, and yerma mate, which both increases thermogenesis, which I found you can actually feel since when I'm fasting, I typically get a lot colder easily than if I weren't. Orexin, interestingly enough, is also actually triggered by the hormone ghrelin, the hunger hormone. So now that you know what to expect and how to do a, 20, a 48 hour fast safely, let's get into the fun stuff and understand the benefits of fasting and why you should even consider going through this process in the first place. As a quick summary of my last video, within 24 hours, you'll start seeing increases in ketosis within 12 to 16 hours and autophagy ramping up as your insulin goes down between 16 to 24 hours. Within 20 to 48 hours, your ketones continue to ramp up. According to a study in the journal of PLOS1, a study that tracked water fast between four to 21 days noted a 15 to 25 times increase in ketones from the 12 hour period to the 72 hour period. This was across 1,422 subjects at the fasting clinic I mentioned earlier in Germany. Across the other studies I've seen, overweight and obese subjects actually have an increased rate of ketone production compared to lean individuals. Of course, this makes sense because ketones are produced from the conversion of fat from your fat cells or food into a usable form of energy. The second thing we talked about was the increase in BDNF or brain derived neurotrophic factor. And while BDNF does increase through a lot of different factors like even socializing, sunshine, and exercise, fasting is shown to be the largest trigger for its production in the shortest period of time. Your body continues to increase production after 20 hours up to 350% within the first 48 hour range, even compared to a group that did intense exercise based on a study published in the Journal of Applied Physiology, Nutrition, and Metabolism back in 2015. Lastly, autophagy. Of course, this continues to increase at an accelerated rate to do this dead damage cell cleanup. Like I mentioned in my last video, many of the autophagy studies have been conducted on mice, so studies are still ongoing in humans to figure out what the right human intervention is to trigger this at its maximum effect. The current belief is that this is actually either only going to start or increase significantly in the 20 to 48 hour period of fasting, assuming you haven't worked out or done anything to accelerate its initiation. There's one last study I'll mention before I dive deep into the most interesting two benefits, which is your gut microbiome. A study in 2014 published in the Scandinavian Journal of Immunology found that when they infected mice with salmonella, mice that were undergoing a fasting state actually expelled more salmonella bacteria in their gut, but not an increase in other non-pathogenic bacteria. This isn't overly conclusive by any means, but it's another avenue I'll be looking at since a lot of people are seeing the importance of gut microbiome health as a factor for 
overall health. Now, let's jump deeper into two of the most talked about and potentially misinterpreted mechanisms of fasting that I've seen on social media. Benefit number one is human growth hormone and IGF-1. Technically, in some studies, this starts at around 10 hours fasted, but it's only meaningful after 20 hours. IGF-1 is a hormone called insulin growth factor 1, which is a hormone that is created in your liver and even in your bones that gets released when you're low on insulin, which is the reason why insulin seems to be a very key factor in many of the benefits we're talking about. IGF-1, like the name suggests, is what causes your body to start releasing another hormone when you're low on insulin, human growth hormone. Some of you might have heard of this if you do any bodybuilding because, I mean, some people use it exogenously or inject it as a steroid. However, this is actually something your body produces naturally and is currently known to increase the rate and the limit of growth in tissue, namely muscle tissue. Now, I've seen a ton of YouTubers claiming that fasting is somehow amazing for muscle building because of a study that showed that HGH levels in the 20 to 48 hour fasted range actually increases anywhere from 400 to 1600%, which is a massive amount. However, keep in mind what I said earlier, a fasted state with all of the other mechanisms mechanisms that are happening in your body is catabolic, meaning you don't actually build muscles in this state. Instead, the science is pointing to a completely different reason why this happens. This might be the mechanism of what actually prevents healthy muscle cells from breaking down so that when autophagy happens, it can safely target dead and damaged tissues instead of healthy ones. Needless to say, this is one of the key elements that people like me, who want to maintain and build a relatively good level of muscle mass, can be comfortable in knowing that fasting isn't gonna completely demolish your gains. Another note I'll mention on the flip side are influencers who say that you actually do lose lean mass after a fast based on some DEXA scans or body fat measuring devices that they've used. Now first, not only are these notoriously inaccurate readings, but lean mass is a factor of not just muscle mass, but also glycogen stores, which like I mentioned before, you end up depleting before you get into a state of autophagy. Now, I'm not gonna say for certain that no catabolism of healthy tissue happens during an extended fast, primarily because there is actually no way of testing this with absolute certainty, unless you're willing to do a muscle biopsy under incredibly strict study conditions. But personally, given the amount of potential benefits to somebody who was previously obese, the benefits to my current and long-term health, and also my loose skin, far outweighs any downsides to potentially losing a little bit of dry lean muscle mass which I can always rebuild with more weightlifting and exercise in the future. Now, benefit number two is related to stem cells. This is one field of research that somewhat upended the medical community over the past decade. For the longest time in scientific and medical research, certain stem cells have been assumed to only exist in the womb and in babies in early life. That's why they're called embryonic stem cells because these are the type of cells that can actually turn into literally any other cell, around 200 different types in your body. In adults, it was commonly assumed that only specialized stem cells can exist. For example, blood and bone marrow, which can only develop into new blood cells as an example. Research was therefore focused around taking stem cells from embryos in order to treat various diseases like treating liver disease by specializing these embryonic stem cells into specialized liver cells or creating stem cell derived neurons to study its effect on motor neuron disease. However, animal studies at MIT back in 2018 revealed that they could drastically increase the rate of regeneration of stem cells when a subject was in a fasted state. This was recorded after a fasting period of only 24 hours. This was seen equally in both young and old mice alike, so it wasn't something that was specifically to the young mice. Like the BDNF study from my last video, you do have to take into account at the very least the metabolic time difference in mice, which means a 24 hour fasted period in mice may translate into a longer time span in humans. They realized that this provided incredible regenerative properties and protective effects that had implications in older people recovering from GI infections or patients undergoing chemotherapy. As a matter of fact, this actually validates a potential mechanism from a study back in 2008 by Dr. Walter Longo, who is now known for a string of research in something called fasting mimicking diets, which personally I think is somewhat controversial with where he took the study and his findings, but that's a story for another video. Dr. Longo conducted the study where he was expecting to have starvation or fasting as a potential risk factor to chemotherapy, but instead, found that fasting actually protected normal cells, but not cancer cells against high dose chemotherapy, which was actually fatal in fed mice. 
Think back also to HGH and how certain hormones can protect healthy cells but let damaged ones die out and get eaten through autophagy. It seems like a very similar mechanism. This new field of study has created and spawned a whole new field of research in how protective fasting can be even from external factors like chemotherapy to cells and by extension other toxic exogenous substances that would otherwise be harmful to the health of a normal human being. This intervention is actually now being used in chemotherapy patients across the US and I assume other oncology practices worldwide to improve patient outcomes for cancer patients. So all in all, understanding these benefits alongside the increase in autophagy to see how it will help with my loose skin are my mo biggest motivators for doing an occasional 48 to 72 hour fast. If you know any studies or have your own experiences with fasting, feel free to put them into the comments below and I'd love to check them out. And that's it. In my next video, I'm going to be going over the final episode in the series, looking at the final day of a 72 hour fast and a high level guide on how to break your fast safely. This is a fairly new channel, so I would sincerely appreciate that if you've watched this far and enjoyed the content, please give me a thumbs up and a subscribe and join me in my own health journey and fitness journey while helping spread the word of the benefits of fasting to others. I primarily post on here on YouTube and Instagram, both at rehash fitness. This is Joe Guevara, and with that, I hope you all stay curious, stay healthy, and I'll see you all in the next one. Mm -hmm.